Thank you for joining us for today's training on creating high quality case management documentation. This training is presented to you by Switchboard, a one-stop resource hub for refugee service providers in the United States. My name is Megan Rafferty and I'm a training officer with Switchboard, specializing in mental health and wellness. My background is that I'm a licensed professional counselor and have provided strengths-based, trauma-informed mental health services to refugee and immigrant populations for over a decade. Today, I am also joined by my colleague, Maliha Mirza. Maliha is also a training officer with Switchboard, focusing on case management. For nearly two decades, Maliha has worked as a social worker with refugee populations in mental health and hospital settings. She speaks five languages and holds a Master of Social Work from the University of Washington. We are also joined by our colleague, Tigus Coleman, who will be behind the scenes assisting with technology and logistics. All right, I'd like to give you a brief overview of our Zoom settings for today. This is a Zoom webinar, therefore you're joining in listen-only mode. Due to the very large size of the webinar today, we have disabled the chat box. However, you do have the option to message to send messages directly to the speakers, and please keep an eye out on the chat for messages from Switchboard with links to various resources that we're going to be sharing towards the end of our training today. We will also be answering your questions in the Q&A box throughout the session, so we encourage you to direct your questions to that Q&A box so that we can see and respond to them. You can also click the thumbs up to upvote another participant's question if you have the same question. We also hope to have some time at the end today to address any additional questions that you might have or provide additional information. Though we have a lot of material to cover today during this 60 minute webinar. We also want to inform you that today's webinar is being recorded. You will receive an email with the recording the slides, and the recommended resources within 24 hours. The webinar's transcript will also be posted to the Switchboard website within a few weeks, since it takes some time for us in order to comply with web and accessibility standards. And here are the learning objectives that we have for you today. By the end of this session, we hope that you will be able to recognize the importance of documentation within the case management cycle to describe and create different elements of a case file, including case notes, service plans, and critical incident reports that will adhere to most program guidelines, and to utilize new tools and techniques to improve the quality and efficiency of your case management documentation. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Maliha to get our training started. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we want to start with an overview of case management cycle, understanding the main principles and concepts of case management, as well as the goals and expectations of our roles within that system. Next slide. What's case management? Case management is a process that helps clients achieve wellness and autonomy. It's when we assist individuals in gaining access to needed services including medical, social, educational, employment, housing, and others. We do this through a number of activities, including advocacy, assessment, planning, communication, coordination, monitoring progress, and service facilitations. So there are um, three phases of case management. The first phase is initial engagement. This is where we build reports with our clients to get to know them and their unique needs. During this first phase, we spend time giving the client information about our programming, the roles and responsibilities of the case manager and the client. By doing this, we are being transparent with our clients, but also starting to sit at our boundaries. We also began talking about termination during this initial engagement phase. Because we want our clients to know that this is a time-limited relationship and to start preparing them for termination early. The second phase is goal setting to service prevention. During this phase, 
we set goals and determine what we will work on together. Then we work together to meet those goals. This is where most of the case management work is done. During this phase, we want to be sure we are empowering our clients to do what they can while meeting them where they are at. And final phase is termination or discharge. During this phase, we reflect back on the progress that has been made and the goals that were made. Each phase of case management cycle has different type of documentation that you will be using. Most of the documentation you complete during an early phase will be used in a later phase. For example, you may use some sort of assessment tools during the initial engagement phase, where you learn more about your client's needs. After that, you can use that assessment to help you and your clients determine their service goals, and your service plan will be used during the termination phase to help you determine if the client has met their goals and is ready for termination. We're going to get into more details about this type of documentation in the next session of our presentation. So in our next slide, we, um, we have Slido exercise. You can scan the QR code on your phone or go to slido.com to enter the code. Uh, we will give you a minute to answer this question. Why are case notes and other type of documentation important? Great, I see um, a lot of answers in here. So there are so many people here. Um, great, for recording, progress, um, for written records. Yes, okay. So uh, most of you answer uh, for records, of course, records, records keeping, uh, tracking, tracking progress. Um, great answers. Um, thank you uh, for responding. And we would like to go to our um, next slide. Thank you, everyone. You all did great with Slido and came up with a lot of reasons why documentation is important. So documentation is one way that we stay accountable. In a social work field, we have a saying that if you did not document it, it did not happen. So writing your case note and other type of documentation can actually help protect you. If you have even helped a client with a safety risk or had an incident that needed to be reported, your case note can prove that you did all the things you were supposed to. Case management documentation helps you track client progress. Case note can help the case manager remember the detail of each of your meeting with your clients and what you are working on. This type of documentation we are going to talk about today are usually a requirement from your funders. Your documentation can help you show your funders all the important work you have been doing. We also have an ethical and professional responsibility to keep an accurate record of our meeting with clients. These standards are in place to protect us and to protect our clients. And lastly, case notes are important to communication and collaboration within your agency. Supervisors and managers can look at your case note if there are any safety concerns with clients. For example, if you ever get sick or take a vacation and your client shows up to the office, your coworkers are going to use your case note to see what you are working on to help your client while you're away. So now I would like to hand off to Megan. Okay, great. Thank you, Maliha. 
Uh, now we're going to get into talking more about the types of documentation that you'll find in a typical case file in a great bit more detail than we've provided so far. So this, it, this slide shows an example of how a paper case file may be organized. Your agency likely already has a system in place, or you may utilize an electronic record keeping system. Either way, keeping your documentation organized will help increase your efficiency as a case manager. So this graphic shows how a sample case file is divided into four sections. The first section groups all of your intake documents together. So that includes anything that the client may have needed to sign or fill out to initiate services, such as their rights and responsibilities form, consent forms, copies of their identification or income verification that you may have needed to start services. The second section has all of the case notes stored in chronological order. Keeping these notes all neatly together in one section makes it easy to look through them and find information about your past client meetings. The third section groups all of your typical service documents together. So this includes any assessments, service plans, periodic updates, and any termination paperwork that may have been completed. And fourth, it can be really helpful to have a section for all of your case management documents. So this would be anything related to providing services, such as copies of referrals or applications that you've sent in for your client. All right, so now to talk about case notes, the piece of documentation that we're likely all the most familiar with and probably spend a lot of our time on. Case notes are a record of the interactions between the client and case manager. Case notes document key information from your client meetings and should ideally be written at the end of each day. But what should we include in our case notes? Well, we can use the six W's to help us think through all the important elements of a case note. The who, what, when, where, why, and what next. So record who was present in the meeting, including the client's name, the caseworker, the interpreter, and any additional folks who might have been there, such as family members. Write about what happened in the meeting. So all of the important details of what happened in chronological order. Write about when the meeting took place, including the date and the beginning and end time of your meeting. So such as we met from 11.03 to 11.47 a.m. being that specific and precise. We also want to talk about where the meeting took place. So that could have been at the office, could have been at the client's home, or even at a community resource like a food bank. Why the meeting happened. So by this, we mean, was this a scheduled meeting to discuss the client's employment goals that you've been working on? Or was this an unscheduled meeting? Did the client just walk in with an urgent need? And um, you know maybe they were needing rental assistance. So document why. And finally, what next? List any next steps that you and your client are planning, as well as when you plan to meet again with the client. I'd also like to note that it's important to document when a client no-shows to a scheduled appointment and any time that you call or talk to a client on the phone. These notes can be really brief, even just one sentence. They don't have to have all the six W's. But documenting this even in some form will help you start to recognize patterns with your clients, and it will really keep track of all the good outreach work that you're doing. So this is how you can show that even though maybe you haven't seen a client for a few months, you've actually been doing your best. You've been calling them, trying to get them in for another meeting, trying to check in and see how they're doing. So now we have an example of a case note. I will read this out loud, and then we're going to switch over and use our Slido tool again to think of some things that may be missing from this very brief case note, thinking about the six W's. So this note says, client and case manager discussed client's difficulty paying her rent this month. 
case manager will look into rental assistance options for this month. Client thanked case manager. So now we're gonna open up our Slido and answer the question. How would you make this a more effective case note using the six W's? Okay, right, I'm seeing dates, interpretation. So it'll be really important if this, uh, if this uh, client session was provided in another language, let's make sure that we write down what language it was in, make sure we're including if the interpreter was there. Oh, wow, gosh, I'm seeing so many things come through. Um, follow up, so what are you gonna do next? When are they meeting next? Time and date, you guys picked up on a lot of the things that we're missing here. Location, why is the client struggling exactly? Why does the client need rental assistance? And I would even be thinking through, well, what are they gonna do the month after this? Like, how are we gonna make sure that this isn't an issue again? All right, great, yes. I'm seeing 27 more people typing. But I really think that you've covered. That note was really missing a lot of these important uh, important elements. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and move on, but thank you all so much for participating in that. I appreciate it. Okay. So now we're going to move on and talk about service plans. So service plans can go by many names, uh, one of which is a family self sufficiency plan. It really depends on your program but most programs are gonna have a requirement for some type of service plan. This is your guide for service with your client. Everything that you do to help your client should be reflected on your service plan in some way. And service planning should always be collaborative with your client's voice included. So that means the case manager shouldn't be the only one coming up with all the goals. You should be doing this together with your client and individualizing each service plan to meet each different client's unique needs. So service plans should include the area or the reason services are needed in the first place, uh, strengths and supports that the client can use to achieve each goal. Because we wanna take a strength-based and client-centered approach to our services, actually writing down your client's strengths on their service plan can help keep us focused on strengths rather than deficiencies. Of course, service plans should include the goals themselves. Goals are general statements about what the client wants or needs to accomplish, and objectives are the action steps that the case manager and client plan to take to accomplish the goal. So objectives should be much more detailed than the overall goal, and they'll explain how the goal is going to be achieved. So for example, a client and a case manager may decide that a goal is for the client to improve their English. Objectives for that goal could be for the case manager to help the client sign up for classes, teach the client how to use public transportation to get to the classes, and for the client to then attend those classes weekly. Uh, we're going to talk more about how to make these objectives more detailed and measurable on the next slide. All right. So, no conversation about service plans would be complete without talking about SMART goals. So, when you're creating goals and objectives on your service plan, it's important to remember to make them SMART, which stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, relevant and time bound. Setting SMART goals will increase the chances that clients will actually meet their goals and will help to minimize any misunderstandings. So to briefly go through these, specific refers to making sure a goal is focused and clear enough that everyone can easily understand it. To make your goal measurable, Consider including information that will help you identify what success will look like. So this could mean including numbers or percentages when it makes sense. Goals should be achievable. So be sure to think about whether or not a goal is too easy or too difficult to accomplish in the timeframe that you're setting. 
relevant means that you're setting goals that are meaningful. So these should be goals that are within your scope to help the client with. And finally, goals should be time bound. So there should be a target end date for each goal. So an example of a SMART goal may sound like the client will sign up for and attend weekly English classes at the community center within the next three months. And objectives can include the ways that the case manager will help achieve this goal, just like we discussed on the last slide. All right, another type of documentation that you may have to complete and store in your case file is a periodic update. So this is when you have a structured check-in with the client to discuss the progress that's being made towards your client's goals. So these types of updates are much more common for longer term programs, and they may need to be completed every few months depending on your program. Update timelines can vary based on client specific needs, program requirements, or funding requirements. It's important to check in with your supervisor about what updates you are responsible for, including those that may be routine, required, or just best practice. Okay, yes, termination documentation is another important type of documentation for your case file that will be completed as your time with your client comes to a close. So, termination paperwork can look different based on your agency and your program. Many programs require a termination or a closure letter be sent to clients informing them that their case is being closed. Some programs also send a referral or a resource list to those clients with the closure letter just to ensure that clients have their needs covered. Your program may also require a closure checklist so that lists all the documentation that must be in your case file and it might require supervisor, supervisor approval when you're closing out your case. Other programs may require brief summaries that describe the services you provided and the client's progress towards meeting their service goals. And when closing out a client's file, it's important to include the reason for the closure. So this will make sure to anyone who picks up this file why the client's case was being closed. So some reasons that you might close a case are because your client met all their service goals, or maybe because they were no longer eligible for your program. Either way, document the reason why you're closing the case. Also, sometimes clients are no longer working with you because they transferred internally to a different program or to a new case manager. When this happens, you may need to complete a transfer of services form to indicate this change of status in the client's file. Okay, now this slide talks about some specialized types of documentation that are required in rare circumstances. This documentation goes beyond what's typically required in a case note. All of these situations require some extra steps in your documentation and extra details. These situations don't come up every day, but they're really important to be prepared for. Mandatory reporting is required for the abuse and neglect of children and vulnerable adults. I'm sure that you have all had training on this, but be sure to check in with your state on the specific rules and regulations for mandatory reporting. In most cases, case managers would need to call Child or Adult Protective Services to report the incident. And then you need to document that call you made in your notes. So when you write your note for this incident, be sure that you're including the incident number that you received and the name of the staff member that you made the report to. This shows that you made the report and you have the important details if you need to follow up on that. Critical incidents are emergencies where police or ambulances may respond. So that could be something like having a client who had a medical emergency happen in your office and you had to call an ambulance. Most agencies are gonna have a special form for this. So check in with your manager 
on getting this form and all the information needed about how to fill it out. And finally, other crises. So these could include safety concerns related to suicidal or homicidal thoughts or actions of clients. There typically aren't special types of forms for this, but it's important to document these types of concerns very carefully in your case notes. When intimate partner violence is disclosed, be particularly cautious about documentation to ensure safety. Notes regarding these concerns should be kept separate if the case file is for the whole family and therefore would be accessible by the abusive partner. In all of these situations, client safety is our number one priority. After the client safety is ensured, these are all situations that are important to bring up with your supervisor or manager. And even though it's important to do your best every day to write all your case notes in a timely manner, it's extremely important when it comes to these types of events. So if you really can't write your note about this type of incident at the end of the day, maybe because you had to go with your client to the hospital, you were there for hours, at a minimum, make sure that your supervisor is informed and then try to write your note as soon as possible the next day. Okay, that was a lot. Now I'm gonna pass the mic back to Malika. Thank you, Megan. So let's talk about tools and techniques. Next slide, please. So far, we have talked a lot about which, uh, what should be included in a different type of case management documentation. But we would also like to quickly talk about what to not include. It's important not to include your opinions or commentary in case notes. And instead, we want to be stick to the fact. We also don't want to include emotional reaction or value judgment. And of course, you do not want to include false or unrelated information in your case note. We want to be accurate, honest, and brief. Notes should be objective, neutral, and accurate, represented the service provided to the client as well as the client's progress. If you are feeling unsure about whether or not you should write something in your note, a good way to help you decide is, as you write your notes, consider how your client would feel if they read your notes. Would they agree with what you said happened? Would they feel respected by the way you describe them? So now uh, we are going um, to look at another simple case note and think about any changes um, we would like to make, we will use Slido to ask a question to discuss. I will read this aloud. The case uh, note says, client and case manager met for a scheduled appointment to discuss employment. Client doesn't like any job options. I give her and refuses to interview. Client is hard to work with and maybe needs a new case manager. What are some words or expressions used in this case note that you would want to avoid? So here is our Slido again. So please scan the QR code or go to slido.com. And um, our question is, what are some words or expression used in this case notes that you would want to avoid? Yes. I see you guys typing great. Client is hard to work with. This is actually opinion. You don't want to, you did not give any explanation. Um, okay, most of you are typing and um, I see, you know, like most of you see it says client is hard to work with, hard to work with. Um, okay, great. Yes, refuse to interview. That's also opinion. And client does not like. It's an opinion. If clients say that he or she did not like, you should use client code and put it in quotation. She or he did not like. Thank you everyone for your answers and we would like to move on. 
So here is a brief summary or some important documentation consideration we have already touched on during this presentation. We want to make sure to include client voice in your notes whenever possible. This can include using directly quote from clients. Case notes should be exclusive, covering the six Ws, but also consents. You don't need to write a book for each note. Just a few sentences should be enough to cover everything. Remember to track not only what you did in your case notes, but you have to, have to also uh, progress note things that left. This makes case notes helpful organization tools. And finally, case notes need to be timely in order to be helpful. In an ideal world, case notes would always be completed by the end of each day before you leave the office. I know that we don't live in an ideal world, and this doesn't always happen. Sometimes your day ends in a home visit, and you don't get back to the office, and you don't have the chance to write your notes until the next day. This is okay, but do your best to get it written within 24 hours. And once again, we are moving to our next slide. What are some examples of client strengths? Resilience. I see everyone is typing. Great. And I'm going to um, go ahead and read them. Yes. Uh, a strong self advocacy good communication, independence, yeah, motivated, hard to work with, positively, good communication. Yes, independent and of course resilient. So respectful, yes, I do, uh, most of you type resilience and um, thank you everyone again uh, for your answers and uh, we'll like to move to our next slide. As Megan noted earlier, it's important to include client strengths within your documentation. This helps incorporate the client individuality into your documentation and helps keep the strength-based focus throughout your services. And depending on your funders, this may even be a requirement. One important way to incorporate client strengths is in your service plans. You can write about how a client will use their unique strengths to achieve their goals. For example, if you have a client who is very intelligent, they might use that strength to help them achieve their goal of getting their first job. Or if you work with a client who is very kind and friendly, they might use that strength to help them achieve their goal of getting new housing because their personality may help them when talking to an apartment manager at a new housing unit. Now I hand it off back to Megan. Okay, thanks, Maliha. Uh, let's see, can we go to the next slide? Oh, perfect. Okay, now we're going to discuss how you can use templates as a tool to help you. So using templates can improve consistency and serve as a quality control measure to make sure important data points are entered for each case. Not using a template can lead to incorrectly entered or missing information. The primary benefit for staff is that templates can serve as a memory aid. So you don't have to remember every detail of what needs to be included in your documentation every time. Templates should definitely be customized for each program so that they capture all of the important details that are relevant for your specific programming and requirements from your funders. Uh, case, uh, templates should also be broad enough that they allow you to capture the unique elements of each client's case and allow for client voice. Uh, most funders don't like to see case notes that look like they've been copied and pasted. 
Uh, when I was doing direct service, I'll say that I used a template for writing my case notes, writing my service plans, periodic updates, and termination summaries. They're really an invaluable time-saving tool that can also help increase the quality of your work. Okay, peer case file reviews are another tool that can be implemented at your agency to improve the quality of documentation. So if you're not familiar with this, the peer case file review process starts with supervisors selecting case files for review and then assigning reviewers. It's important to make sure that supervisors are selecting about one to two files from each case manager and assigning them to someone else on the team to review. Staff members then utilize a checklist that's been developed by the program manager to review each other's case files to make sure that they are complete and accurate. Next, the file will go back to the case manager whose file it is to then fix any errors or deficiencies that they can. Then the case file will go back to the supervisor for final review and sign off. If you wanna implement a peer review process at your organization, we recommend that agencies schedule time for staff to do this together for a couple of hours each quarter. That way, if it can be done all together in a couple of hours, it doesn't become one more stressful item on a to-do list. All right, and now I wanna to briefly touch on confidentiality when it comes to documentation. Making an effort to protect confidentiality is very important to develop and maintain trust with your clients. Protecting confidentiality is everyone's responsibility at your organization, not just direct service staff who are responsible for creating the documentation. Support staff, managers, everyone else at the agency are also responsible for keeping our clients' information private. That means not leaving documents out on desks that have client information on them, locking filing cabinets and computer screens when we walk away from them. As a general reminder, you should also get releases of information before sending your clients private information to outside agencies and use encrypted emails when you're sending external emails. Also, be sure to inform your clients of the limits to confidentiality so that any disclosures of information do not come as a shock or feel like a breach of trust. Finally, we know that these last few years have allowed for remote or hybrid work, and sometimes our home actually becomes our office. It's important to note that confidentiality still applies at your home office. So make sure that anyone else in your home can't hear you if you're having a private conversation with or about a client and that they don't have access to any client information. Okay, we have one last Slido for you today on the most important topic of the day, really. How do you prevent yourself from getting behind on your paperwork? This is such a challenge. It was a huge challenge for me. I know it's a challenge for most people. And I think this is a great opportunity to hear from each other. You know, what do you do that works? So let's see. Time management, of course. So like scheduling time weekly, keeping an agenda. Yes. Using an Outlook calendar and sticky notes checklists. All these important organizational tools. Prioritizing, that's very important. Time blocking, using a planner, calendar, keeping a routine. Yes, these are great. A lot of people are saying keep an agenda, making notes, writing a to-do list or a checklist. Awesome. Ooh, I saw re reserve Fridays for paperwork catch up. That's great. Scheduling time regularly. Focus on writing concise notes. Yes, I hope that we have driven that point home today. That really helps save time. 
Okay, I see a few more people typing. Regularly scheduled time for it, yes. Okay. Using five minutes here or there. Yep, absolutely. These are great. Okay, thanks everyone. I think we're gonna go ahead and move on. Great, all right. So these are our time management tips that we have for you today. I think that you have already touched on a lot of them, honestly. Uh, we know that fitting in case notes when you have so many other things going on is such a huge challenge. Uh, probably one of the most difficult parts of our jobs, even more so than the work with clients a lot of times. So number one on this list is prioritize tasks. I know I, I saw some of you hit on that in the Slido. Prioritize what is most important for you to get done each day. Number two, set boundaries with clients. So sometimes we have those clients that can really demand a lot of our time, that stay past their schedule time, who walk in every time they need something. Some clients can really push our boundaries and ask us to help with tasks that we know they can do themselves. Continuing to set boundaries with clients and encouraging them to do what they can themselves will free up a lot of your time. Number three, a lot of you were hitting on this in the Slido. Schedule time to get your notes done. So as long as you're diligent about actually sticking to this, so as long as you're actually using the time that you set aside to write your notes, this can be extremely effective. Ask your manager if you can block out time on your calendar each day to get notes done. Sometimes I know I would block out the time, but then I would get stuck doing another task that was really urgent. And then it was like, oh, darn, I lost my note time. So if you can really stick to it, it's really helpful. Okay, limit distractions. There's often so much, oh, sorry about that. Number four, limit distractions. There's often so much going on around us at our agencies that it can be hard to focus. If you work in an office with a door, I say shut your door. Maybe even write a little note on your door to let your coworkers know that you're concentrating on writing case notes and please not to interrupt you unless it's an emergency. Personally, for me, I find wearing headphones very effective. Um, or if you're having trouble concentrating, you can even try just setting a timer for 15 minutes and writing as many notes as possible during that time. Sometimes short bursts like that are just the best that we can do. Uh, number five, don't let it pile up. So just a few days of getting behind on notes can lead to a huge pile up. Of course, the best way to avoid a pile up is to just not let that happen in the first place. Even if you can only squeeze in five minutes or 10 minutes before you leave for the, you know, leave and go home for the end of the day. Even if you can only write one note, just get done what you can because it's just one less note that you have to write later, you will thank yourself. And number six, finally, uh, consider using a template to write your notes. I know as we just discussed, we covered this in detail. Templates can take a lot of the mental burden out of writing case notes and can just make it easier to get them done quickly. Okay, so that really brings us to the end of the training section of our webinar today. And surprisingly, we do have a bit of time left for Q&A. So I, I know that we've uh, seen some questions from, come through the Q&A box. We'll see if we can maybe go through and answer any of those live. We also had some questions come through uh, pre-registration. Uh, but before we do that, I do wanna mention that we have an upcoming webinar on March 16th, Creating Balance in Case Management. And we're gonna use that webinar time to answer some of our most frequently asked questions about how to balance your caseload with your paperwork or other administrative duties. So we hope that we're gonna be able to answer some of your questions about setting client boundaries, setting boundaries at work, and creating a good self-care or work-life balance. So please join us for that webinar, March 16th. I think Tigus will put that in the chat for us. So we do have a question here. 
um, based on your experience in case management, how many cases is um, re it recommended for each case manager to be successful at this? And um, of course, you know, every organization have their rules and responsibilities, and they may determine how many cases a case manager should take. Um, and again, also, you should see how many cases, you know, you could um, manage per week or per month. And if you feel like you have a high caseload and you're not able to take care of each client and also, you know, you're overworked and working more than what you expected to work, you should have a conversation with your supervisor to um, decrease your caseload. Uh, and Megan, if you want to add anything, go ahead, please. Uh, no, Emily, hi, thank you. You did a great job answering that one. Um, it's really, it really depends on your uh, specific program. Caseloads can vary from being very small to very large, again, depending on intensity of clients and complexity of the work. So, yeah. And also, we do have a question. Are there any case management software you recommended? And um, again, uh, some agencies may still use uh, paper files that, um, you know, you type and you print and put in a uh, your client chart, or some may have electronic database. And unfortunately, again, an organization also may have their own software to use. Um, so I won't recommend any other software outside of your organization we use. Yeah, we've got a few questions about software in our pre-registration questions. And um, it, it's really hard to pinpoint one, one software that will work for everybody because all programs are really unique, and so it's important to find something that's going to be able to be customizable to your um, program to be able to capture all those different data elements um, that, that you want uh, for your programs. And so, you know, also thinking about, you know, what's going to be affordable, um, what's, what's going to be uh, user-friendly for your, your staff. There's a lot of considerations that go into it. And I think, Megan, this is for you. When you say template, is this just a Word document that has what is it needed for the case note? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, yes, it, it, again, it depends on if you're doing paper records or if you have an electronic record keeping system. If you have that electronic system, you can really develop it in there in the system so that when a case manager goes to click on a case note, it just kind of pops up this template for them to enter the, the data there. But if you're working out of paper case files, yeah, you can really just use a Word document that maybe you type out and you fill in by hand. It depends on your kind of agency expectations around record keeping, whether you do those um, typing or writing by hand. But yeah, a Word document works great. Um, I know that we get a lot of questions for samples or examples of templates. We are going to be uh, releasing um, a downloadable resource on the topic of case management documentation. So I hope we can give you some more ideas or guidelines um, there in the future. All right, let's see, any other questions? Just reading through this Q and A, we've got a lot going on in here. Uh, yep, can you share templates with us, like the service plan template? Um, like I said, I would love to be able to share those out. We'll have to see what's uh, realistic for us to be able to do. At least give you some more examples in our downloadable resource. Um, in what situations do you not need to use the six W's, and can the case note be very short? You had mentioned phone calls. Yeah, I would say for um, phone calls, or if you want to document any other written communication that you get from clients, like text messages or emails that come through, um, you can always like take a screenshot of the text message and print it out, or print out a copy of the email. Um, but otherwise, when you're calling a client and they don't answer, I would document that just to show. Hey, look, we tried to call, but but they weren't there. You know, I've reached out several times, but the client's not getting back to us. I would also document no shows. Um, so if you had a scheduled appointment, but your client didn't come to it, I would just keep 
brief sentence record of that. Okay. And also someone asked, can you say please an example of an emotional um, reactions, like what to not include? Um, you don't want to include like um, caseworker feel sorry for client going through um, this situation or clients having hard time paying rent. Case worker say that I'm sorry for this, or it must be hard to uh, deal with and I feel bad for you. So those are actually uh, things you don't want to um, mention in your caseload because again, it's opinion and emotional reaction, what you feel. And you don't want someone to read as a case manager how you feel in there. So you want to write in your case note what the client has said and how what you have worked together. And again, you recommend, you validate it, you suggest it, things like that. Okay, I see a question. Any suggestions for managers or caseworkers who may not necessarily be trained in social work field or in the US school system or social services field? Um, we are gonna have some recommended resources at the end of our uh, webinar today. And so I would recommend starting there, checking those out. As I mentioned, we're hoping to also create another new resource for you soon. Um, really starting there and of course, checking in with your supervisor and manager about their um, expectations and what else you can do to improve the quality of your documentation. There are a lot of questions, yes. I know, I know. I see another one about, can you speak to uh, physical versus electronic client files? Are you seeing more organizations transition to electronic record keeping using both, sticking to physical only? Um, that's a great question. I, I think really it, it takes some sort of organizational assessment to see what's gonna be best for your particular organization. Um, in past years, I am noticing you know, a lot more places transition over to electronic record keeping. There's a lot of benefits to it. Um, but, you know, I, I've worked in paper files for, for years and years, and that worked out just fine, too. So, so specific to your particular organization, what's going to work best. Okay. So, um, what's... Um... Individuals are asking for um, template, and unfortunately, we do not have any template to share. And um, your organization should be giving you a template. Again, if you have electronic uh, database, there will be a template. It, it might say phone call. It might say case note. It, if you're working in counseling field, it might say counseling notes. Or versus, you know, you may have a, um, a template on your um, computer through your organization may say client name, date of birth, or the date you have seen them and case note, or what's your next plan, or may uh, maybe you will mention client's goal. And again, please check with your um, supervisor to see if you, your organization have any template that you could use. Yeah. All right, I'm seeing a question about creating, how do you create client boundaries? And I do wanna, just table that because we are going to get into that in a lot of detail again in that webinar that we've got coming up in a couple of weeks, March 16, uh, creating balance and case management. I hope that you can come join us for that one where we're going to be talking a lot more about uh, client boundaries. Okay, I see what's important for a closure checklist. So that would be um, just including all of the documentation that you would expect to find within the case file. So for example, if your program has a requirement that you take a photocopy of the client's ID when you begin services, or that you fill out a particular intake form, or that the client signs their rights and responsibilities form, I would just create a checklist which each of these types of documentation that should be in the file for the case manager to go through and kind of do a self audit of their own uh, case file and just make sure everything is in there. And so honestly, that's where those peer reviews really become really helpful so that before you get to the part where you're closing out your client, you might not even be able to get in touch with this client again. You're, uh, you're checking on these same types of documents, making sure that they're all in your case file um, so that at that point you could potentially fix any mistakes. 
And I see a question. Um, it says not related case management, but say any suggestion on how to motivate, encourage client to attend their um, case management appointments. Uh, we are um, experiencing a high volume of um, no-shows and aren't sure why or how to address, um, overcome it. So basically, if clients are not showing, um, the best practice is that you are writing your accurate notes that may you may you know call them and you left them a voicemail or um, they may call you left your voicemail they're not able to come or maybe they have transportation issue and also if you know your again your organization may have a rule if you if your client don't show up multiple times you might send them a letter if you are sending them a letter please also document that to make sure client uh, you send a letter to them and also you document it in your case note. And um, just follow up once you send them a letter. Um, and um, other recommendation is if they don't speak English, try to send a letter in their native language that they understand how important it is to attend their appointment. Great. All right, we have just a few minutes left. I, I see another question about um, the webinar on the 16th. If you can't make it, if I register, will I still get the recorded version of the training? Yeah, so I'd say go ahead and register for that. Even if you can't make it, we'll still send you out the slide deck and the recording. We'll, even if you don't register, it will be made available on our website within just a few days after the training. So you can always visit us um, at our website to get uh, the recorded versions of these. Okay, and just in the interest of time, I think we'll close it out there for our Q&A section and we will move on. So yes, we have our learning objectives here. Uh, we hope that we have met these learning objectives that we set out to accomplish in the beginning and hope that we've uh, provided you some good information here. So now we do have some great resources to share with you all, like I mentioned, but before we do that, please help us help you by completing our survey for this training. We always take your feedback very seriously and use it to try to improve and create even better webinars for you in the future. This is a 30 second, three question survey, and it helps us immensely when you can fill it out. So we are dropping the link in the chat. You can also take out your phone and scan this QR code, and we will put 30 seconds on the clock right now to give you time to fill this out. So we're gonna wait with you, please, 30 seconds. All right, that's our time. Thank you to those of you who have completed the survey for us. We will also send out the survey in our follow-up email. So if you weren't able to complete it today, please do so when that email comes through. And now we have our recommended resources for you. You will get this full list uh, in the slide deck as, long, as well as the copy of the recording for the webinar. Um, and the slide deck all in the email. So Tigist is also gonna be dropping some of these links in the chat for you right now, if you wanna check these out, or you can wait until you get the email from us. Oh, Tigist, can we go to the next slide? All right, perfect. Okay. All right, and then, Finally, here is Switchboard's contact information. So we do hope that you'll stay in touch with us and join us for future trainings. We wanna let you know about a webinar that we have coming up next week on Tuesday, March 7th from two to 3 p.m. Eastern time on understanding proselytism and culturally responsive faith sharing with refugees and other newcomers. This should be a really interesting webinar that I have been really excited about attending for some time now. So I do encourage you to register for that webinar as well. I think we're gonna put the link for that in the chat. And um, as we mentioned earlier, we've got our, our next webinar on creating balance in case management on March 16th. We think that will help kind of close the loop on some of these questions that we were 
um, unable to answer today and kind of finish off this conversation that we started. So please sign up and join us for that as well. And I want to close out with a big thank you for our audience for your participation today. It makes it so fun when you join us and participate in the Slidos. Uh, we also wanna thank you for your continued dedication to serving newcomers and doing the high quality work that you do every day. I of course also wanna thank my colleagues, Malika and, and Tigas for their help and all their hard work today. So thank you so much and have a great day.